In my shed, I have a box full of ancient documents. Here's a selection of them. That's not all of them. They're letters from friends and family from that I've kept from about the mid-1980s, so some 35 years. And this is what some of the letters look like that used to come from overseas. Uh, you may remember those, aerograms. I've kept these letters, I think, because they remind me of precious people in my life, people who love me, people who have invested in my life. And we don't write letters much these days, at least not like that. But I wonder if you were to write a letter to someone that you love, what would you say? Think of the people that are closest to you. If you wanted to write a letter to express your heart to them, to express your deepest feelings to them, I wonder what you would say. We're going to look at an ancient letter today and over the coming weeks. It comes from the first century. And in the first century, writing letters was probably the main form of communication across distance. Of course, there were no telephones, there was no internet, uh, no television, nothing like that. And so people had to write letters if they wanted to communicate across a distance. Most of the New Testament in the Bible is actually uh, a, a collection of letters. 21 out of the 27 books in the New Testament are letters. And most of them were written by one person, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 of them. One of his most personal letters is to a church in Philippi. It's known as Philippians. It's a letter that's full of joy full of love and uh, we're going to be looking at this as I said in the in the coming weeks and just in the introduction to this letter we see how Paul felt about the people at Philippi listen to some of the things he says it starts this way Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. A few verses later, he says, It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It's clear from those introductory comments that Paul really loves the people at Philippi and he clearly sees them as friends, very close friends. But for Paul, as he writes to this church and to the other churches in the New Testament, he sees church as much more than just a bunch of good mates. It's not just a club for he and his friends to hang, hang out at. The church is much more than that. Paul sees the church as a family. Just listen to that introduction again in the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul calls God not only the Father, but our Father. He is saying there that God is the Father of all of those who follow Jesus. And then later in the letter, and seven times in the letter, he refers to the Philippian Christians with a word that's traditionally translated as brothers. In the more modern versions of the Bible, you'll see it translated as brothers and sisters. It's a Greek word that literally means from the same womb. From the same womb. And so Paul sees these Philippian Christians as his spiritual brothers and sisters. It reminds me of a verse written by the Apostle John in his first letter, where he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Christians can say, I am a child of God. We collectively as the church are the children of God. We are a family. 
Now, the interesting thing about this thing called the church and the church family is the way it's made up is not by our decisions and our choices. It's, it's made up by God's choice. The makeup of the church is first and foremost God's choice. For example, the first Christians at Philippi, as we discovered last week, as we looked at its foundations in Acts chapter 16, the first Christians at Philippi were made up of three really interesting people. A very successful and wealthy itinerant businesswoman, a prison warden who most probably was an army veteran and uh, was showing signs of PTSD, and a slave girl who was being controlled by evil men and an evil spirit. Now, I wonder if we would befriend any of those three people. Would we be willing to count people like this as our friends, let alone a brother and sisters? You know, we are all born once physically into a, an earthly family. All of us are born into our own family, many different families. But when we become a Christian, the Bible says we're born again. And when we're born again, born spiritually, that second time we're born into one family. And that family is known as the church. Now think for a moment about families. How are families designed to function? How does your family function? When you think about your family of origin or the family that you've become responsible for, I guess some of us might be tempted to use the word dysfunction. We think, you know, our family has got some dysfunctional kind of uh, traits about it. And that may be true, but I think that actually every family is dysfunctional because no family is perfect. Every family has problems. Every family has challenges. And so none of us are purely uh, functional in the way that we should be. All of us, in a sense, are dysfunctional. But notice what Paul says to the Philippian church uh, about their family and how the church family is supposed to function, how it's designed to function. He says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul not only sees the church as a family, but he sees that family as being made up of people who are partners. They're in partnership together. And I wonder what comes to mind when you think of this word partner. Uh, nowadays, I guess we might think of a romantic relationship, two people in a romantic partnership, or perhaps a business relationship. Well, Paul uses a Greek word that uh, is used quite a lot in church circles, or has been used a lot. It's the, it's the Greek word koinonia. And that word is translated very often as fellowship. And in church circles, the word fellowship usually comes to mean Christians kind of hanging out together and enjoying each other's company. We might talk about having fellowship after the service over a cup of tea or coffee. And, and so that's how the word fellowship is often used. But the way the Bible uses this word in the original Greek, it, is, it has so much more meaning and depth to it than that. The word carries a very strong idea of participation. Participation. If I was to illustrate this, if you think about a romantic partnership, the people who are in that romantic relationship, the partners, have to actively participate in the relationship in order to keep it growing and healthy. Or if you're thinking of a business partnership, the business partners have to actively participate in the company, in the business relationship. They have to invest Financially, yes, but also personally into that relationship in order to keep the company healthy and growing. And so too, Christian partners are called not just to socialize together, but to actively participate in what they share in common together. 
It's not a romantic relationship. It's not a business relationship. It's something else that they share in common together. What is it? Paul says it's a partnership in the gospel, a partnership in the gospel. And that word gospel, as I said last week, is simply the word, a word that means good news. And in particular, in the New Testament, it's used to describe the good news, the great news, the wonderful news about Jesus Christ. So Paul says, hey, Philippians, my brothers and sisters, we have a partnership together in this thing called the gospel. And, and, and we, we're called to do something with it. We're called to participate in this gospel work. Now, what does that look like? Well, one example is found towards the end of chapter one of Philippians, where Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in, in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. And so partnership is the idea of Christians working together to get the good news about Jesus out to other people, despite whatever opposition they may face. Now here in Australia, Christians don't face a great deal of opposition. I guess, if anything, we might face indifference towards the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Uh, we might face a bit of antagonism, but we don't face the kind of opposition that people in the first century faced, persecution, where they actually had to risk their lives for the sake of getting this message out. There are many Christians around the world in this 21st century who also face that kind of opposition and persecution. And our partnership together our fellowship together is not just about sharing a cup of tea after church. It's not just about socialising together and enjoying each other's company. It's the idea, perhaps is a bit more like uh, that book by J.R.R. Tolkien uh, and the movie, of course, the first, the first part of the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings known as The Fellowship of the Ring. That's more what this idea of fellowship is. It's it's when you think about the Fellowship of the Ring, you think about that, that story. It's, a, it's a, a bunch of friends together, friends that have been kind of thrown together. Not all of them would necessarily fit together. They're a bit disparate, this group. But they're friends who've been thrown together and they're on an adventure, an adventurous journey. They're on kind of a quest, I guess, or a mission, we might say. And they face many trials and tribulations and troubles, but they face them together and overcome them together. And that's what the church is about. That's what fellowship is. We are on a journey together. It's a somewhat adventurous journey. There are trials and tribulations along the way, but we're called to face them together. You know, one of the greatest challenges we face in our faith is the challenge of change. And I'm not just talking about changes that happen in our society or changes that even might happen in the church, changes that have been forced upon us by things like COVID-19. I'm talking about personal change, that deep inward change that we all desire but find so challenging. How can we do this? How can we achieve real change in our lives? Well, we're going to look at that soon. But first, we're going to look at a clip called What's Your Problem? And then after that, we'll share communion together. And then we'll come back and have the second part of this message. <laughs> 